first thing that I wanted to ask is to relate, you know, to the theme of the conference, right? So in terms of identity and feminism or identity and, you know, the status of women and where, you know, the status of women stands today, you know, whether it's provincially, locally, uh, you know, uh, you know, where do you see that, you know, going or where do you see that being right now? And what do you see the linkages between the themes of identity or so in a, cer in a certain sense, I'm also asking you <laughs> to tell us what, you know, identity is or what, where identity fits in in the mix for you. Oh you know? my God. Hey, you chose a really easy question to, <laughs> to start. God, um, I'm going to try to answer in English, but I'm, I'll probably skip to French because even though, as I was saying before, when we arrived, um, I am Franco-Ontarian. Um, nobody knows that, but so I was brought up in both languages and English is sort of a, a native tongue as well, but I don't speak it as much as I used to, so I'm not always that comfortable. So, what I, you, you want me to talk about the, ident the link between feminism and identity or what? Yeah, and you know, the status of women today and what the linkages might be between you know, identity and how you know, that facilitates, how that uh, possibly maybe negates uh, any progress in terms of you know, uh, the status of women maybe, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, you know, I'm thinking Not, of yeah. the boys club and you know, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I think what we hear in Quebec still today, um, in sort of a, in a common way, is that women have it all. That we've we've gained the rights. Uh, we still hear that that feminism is a moot point. That uh, feminist um, that to fight for uh, women's rights uh, is is um, unnecessary because every everything has been has been gained. Feminism constantly um, is a way to point out what is missing. It, it's a way to, it's a, it's a pair of, it's glasses we wear to look at society and point out where um, humans who are identify or who self-identify as women in our society are discriminated against because of that fact. And in by women, I mean, that's a, there's another, um, for me, feminism has to do with equality uh, clearly, as it always has, but it, it also has to do with diversity. It has to do with making sure that everybody in our communities is represented. So if we think of the government, it's not about representing, at, like asking for parity, so for an, an equal number of men and women, that's not sufficient. What, what I fight for as a feminist is, is more than that. It's, I want a real diversity at the level of government. I want everybody to be represented. From wh wh Whether it's a question of um, uh, cultural identity or um, LGBTQ communities or uh, handicapped people. I mean, that diversity has to be represented at the level of power. So I don't know if that answers in part your question, but when we talk of the boys club, it, or when I read the boys, or I, I try to analyze what, a, what, it, what is a boys club, uh, what I'm discussing is how um, the default of our society is to put in power people who all look the same, and those people generally are white male. Um, and they usually come from a certain background, a cer certain social class, they have a certain age. Um, I will say in, in my book, they dress a similar way and they, they keep power amongst themselves. Um, when I wrote The Boys Club, The Boys Club came after a, for another book that I wrote, which is Serial Girls, which was translated in, in English by um, uh, a publishing house called Between the Lines in Toronto. Serial Girls was a study of the, this representation of women that we all know, uh, of women that are all, all alike. So they're white, they have, they're pretty, pretty thin, um, they have breasts, they have long hair. We see them on, uh, in publicities. They're usually uh, side by side, like um, cover girls or uh, on a catwalk, they're models. Um, they'll be um, the Rockettes. Um, Le Corps de Ballet, like in Swan Lake. So I was interested in that image of women, and I was trying to think what that representation of women said about the role or the place of women in society. And I, I tried to analyze this, this figure in a variety of films and TV series and images and, and, and works um, of literature to show that, to prove that women's place was ornamental that the place that is given to us as women um, by the, the means of this all of us alike 
uh, was that we were um, essentially ornamental. But there's a part of that that's also important to me is that these these images of women that I'm sure you can see in your in your head because they're part of our daily lives. Um, these women are side by side or one uh, behind another. They do not look at each other. They're not friends with each other. They don't have allies. While the boys club, when I so years after that, I, I was, of course, thinking of the boys club because everybody was asking me, well, what, what are you saying about men? Aren't men also serialized? Aren't they all the same? And I would answer, yeah, they're the same, but usually for power reasons, they are part of the army or they're uh, religious men or they're, so there are different varieties of, of men in uniforms. But the boys club is this image of men that we can imagine around the table wearing their suits, really rich, expensive suits, um, bankers around a conseil d'administration table, and they're exchanging something. They'll be ex exchanging uh, un projet de loi, or they'll be exchanging money. Um, they'll be in, playing golf together, going to a sauna together. They'll be raping women together, which is also one of the images of the boys club. So this figure, this figure of the boys club, what I was interested in was to is see how it is represented in a number of um, films and TV series, American Psycho comes to mind. There's a, this really amazing scene in American Psycho where they're in a restaurant and they're all dressed the same, they're all really rich and they're really arrogant and they're uh, very misogynist and homophobic and racist. I mean, they are the embodiment of what the boys club is. But for the most part, the boys club is sort of a, a submarine. It just, it, that's why we can talk about systemic. It is, uh, ça traverse le, notre société. It's like, it is like a submarine, as if we were just the, on the top and it's just under us and it's just working under us and it's controlling everything. Um, of course, things are changing. I mean, there are more women and people um, uh, of the diversity that are in power granted, but the boys club is still the major force. And that's what I was interested in. I'm really not sure I'm talking about identity, but you know, I hope I am no, in no, some way. Uh... <laughs> Very much. I should have maybe started with asking you, you know, to give uh, the people in the room who might not be familiar with the Boys Club a little bit of a synopsis, but you, you did so did. <laughs> in the answer to the question. So, did you want to... poursuivre <laughs> Et euh, je viens de lire aussi une entrevue dans la presse où tu disais qu'effectivement, c'est pas... Euh, les hommes n'en les hommes sont peut-être même pas au courant. Mais oui, absolument. Euh, et donc, il y a ce et que c'est dans les structures. Mm -hmm. Et euh, étant donné que « systémique », c'est un mot de jour... C'est un mot dangereux. Euh, et dangereux, effectivement. Euh, J'aimerais euh, peut-être que tu expliques, ou peut-être même avec quelques exemples, cette idée de système ouais. derrière le « boys club » qui pourrait euh, aussi servir d'exemple dans notre type de discrimination oui. systémique euh, oui, qui oui, est vigoureusement refusée euh, par certaines personnes. Oui, oui. On refuse le, le racisme systémique. Je pense que, bon, moi, j'ai envie, peut-être que ça va venir, je pense qu'il faut qu'on commence à parler de sexisme systémique ou même d'homophobie systémique ou de capacitisme systémique. C'est-à-dire que toutes les personnes qui ne, sont, qui ne correspondent pas à, à un certain type d'être humain euh, sont rapidement exclus, mais exclus de manière très, euh, parfois très douce, pas nécessairement de manière violente, mais de manière un peu euh, nonchalante. Il y a une nonchalance dans, dans le systémique, où on, au fond, on, on se permet de ne pas penser à. Um, if I think of the government, or even of the parliament, let's not say the government, the actual parliament, or the Assemblée nationale, or any form of um, parliament, whether it's Montreal or, I mean, maybe it's better with Valérie Plante right now because she is a woman. But if we talk of, syst of system, I mean, that system is, is um, it will be, um, it will manifest itself in the kinds of law that we're going to propose, like projet de loi that will not include certain portions of the population because the person who is uh, imagining these laws does not think of the other portion of the portions of the populations that they or he does not represent. But even in a very pragmatic, very kind of um, um, way, um, the way that politicians tend to faire des affaires, the kind of schedule that will be theirs at the Assemblée Nationale. If men are in power, for the, if the majority of députés are men, 
um, who are in heterosexual relationships uh, with women who take care of children, their default is that they can they can uh, talk, work until very late at night. They can go um, eat and keep discussing things. They can go to a bar. They can do whatever. They don't have that um, necessity to think of the people that they care for. That is a kind of a tradition. I mean, that's what um, Pauline Marois described as the plafond de verre, like the glass ceiling for women in, um, in politics has to do with what women were actually physically able to do because they had people that they cared for. Pauline Marois had a number of children. I don't remember exactly how many, but it was something like five children. She had, um, of course, she was a wealthy woman, so she had hired help. I mean, we have to remember that. That is why she was able to be the politician that she became at the time when she was um, such a politician. She had hired help. How else would she have been able to do it? And her husband was very willing to stay at home and take care of the children as well. And so, pardon me? And wealthy. And wealthy, yes, they're very wealthy people. So this is a very singular example. So we can't take Pauline Marois and say, see, see, she's a, I mean, she was a female politician and she did it, so she was able to break the glass ceiling. She actually really didn't break the glass ceiling for everybody because she is of a very specific um, cultural class and had a very specific way of managing things. But what she is able to um, denounce today is how, because she was a woman, she was a mother, she was a wife, um, and she did want to take care of her kids even though she had hired help, she was excluded from certain aspects of negotiations, of, of a certain way that politic, uh, politics are done, because it's, politics were done and still are, uh, between men who have a certain uh, liberty of schedule. So this is a very pragmatic example. It may seem banal, but it has everything to do with how power is kept, uh, how it's done, how it's negotiated. Uh, if women are excluded from golf games, well, during those golf games, they're not just like, you know, they push pas juste des balles, they push des idées. They're actually, you know, negotiating ideas. They're negotiating money. Um, and it, like speaking of money, if we say, okay, there's a, there are more women at the government, but what kind of, um, how do you say that in English, les portefeuilles, what kind of budgets are we giving them? At, what, at the head of what ministry are we putting them? Usually we put women at ministries of culture, for instance, because culture, we know it, is not so important. Um, they're not going to, ils vont pas brasser des grosses affaires. Il y aura pas des gros portefeuilles, beaucoup d'argent, là, à, à, à faire. Donc, il y a eu des femmes qui ont eu des, des le ministre des, de, qui ont été ministres des Finances. C'est arrivé. Mais de manière générale, on va donner aux femmes des ministères qui sont beaucoup moins importants, euh, en termes de budget puis en termes de politique. Voilà. J'ai une question qui, qui vient avec un autre exemple de ce type de boys club et en même temps peut-être euh, une question par rapport à ton avis sur euh, la nécessité de ces remaniements. Euh, on est en train de euh, changer ou on espère pouvoir changer euh, le processus juridique dans le cas des agressions sexuelles, mm -hmm. violences sexuelles. Ouais. Donc, euh, ah. <rire> Il de... Donc euh, ça pourrait être un exemple de, oui. de la tradition qui a fait, fait en sorte que les punitions, euh, les crimes n'ont pas été considérés à leur oui. juste valeur. Oui. Ton avis sur ce processus? Ben, C'est important. Je, je pense qu'on a entendu récemment une juge qui disait qu'il ne fallait pas que le tribunal soit, enfin, que ce soit un tribunal séparé du tribunal enfin, ordinaire qu'on qu connaît, parce que d'envoyer une cause à un tribunal spécifique, ce serait de déjà juger coupable, d'une certaine façon, la personne, donc d'enlever la présomption d'innocence. Bon, J'entends hein, le côté juridique compliqué là, de, de cette affaire-là, mais dans tous les cas, il faut que quelque chose soit fait pour que les, les victimes de violences sexuelles peu importe qui elles sont d'ailleurs, hein, que ce soit un homme, une femme, peu importe euh, qui est le, la personne euh, jugée, enfin considérée responsable, l'accusé, euh, il faut que le processus soit différent. Il faut que, le, il faut que le, la personne qui est victime de violences sexuelles soit accompagnée dans le processus de dénonciation. The problem is that that solitude, the, the way if you if you do um, end up going to the cops and saying I was raped, and then the procureur de la couronne, le DPCP, um, they decide to take on your cause, you are with them, but you don't have a lawyer on your side. You don't have anybody. I mean, you have people from les Calax, You have il y a des intervenantes who can accompany you, but we, there would need to be a better accompaniment. Um, there needs to be a change of the culture of how you, there, there are still um, 
malheureusement, less, but it still happens. Um, comment, je, uh, comment je peux dire, une sorte d'évaluation de la vie passée de la victime. Donc, quel genre de vie sexuelle est-ce que la victime a eu? On le voit dans les films, hein? je veux dire, c'est comme un truc classique dans Law and Order SVU. I mean, we still see that, how, how victims are going to be... Um, Um, put to pieces uh, their past lives, their past lovers, uh, their, sexual, uh, their sexual past lives and all that. But that still happens. You still have lawyers who, who use that because it is a possibility to do it. So that has to be rethought. Um, uh, there are tons of things that need to be rethought. To, and so that we, can, we have to stop thinking that it's easy for victims of sexual violence to Um, dépose une plainte, to, to actually go to the police and, and go through the whole process. The number of, um, of cases who do end up prosecuted are minimal, in, I mean infinitely minimal in comparison to the number of actual cases of sexual violence. And this only involves, I mean this has to do with um, very obvious cases of, of let's say quote unquote rape, but every There, there's a whole éventail, there's a whole range of sexual violences. And the most ordinary sexual violences, they usually just fall through the cracks. I mean, you can't go to the cops for that, or if you did, they would pretty much uh, dismiss you. So there's a change of culture that has, to be, um, that has to happen. And that special counsel who has suggested a new tribunal participates in that change of culture. It's very long. That is also what feminists are at work doing, um, whether you see it or not, because most women who are feminists work in the community sector, they work in the dark, nobody knows what they're doing, but they're, they're actually protecting women. Right. Well, I want to follow up because, uh, you know, when you accepted our invitation, uh, one of the things that I immediately thought of asking you is this rash of feminicide yeah. uh, that's going on, right? So. I, it raised all kinds of questions in my mind, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Is So was it always there and we didn't notice? Is there really an increase? If there's mm. an increase, and why is it? And then, you know, it relates back to something that you said. Uh, women are ornamental. We're not as far as advanced as we think we are in terms of the status of women. Uh, that it's not a historical artifact, that we've won the fight and it's over, mm. right? So... I mean, what are the linkages? Why are we where we are now in terms of these feminicide? This is mm -hmm. a very local, provincial, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, that's issue just in Quebec. I mean, yeah, yeah, that we're seeing in Quebec, and you know, uh, you know, I don't want to be macabre, but it's uh, obviously something that's very worrisome. So no, I wanted to pick your mind about this. Yeah, I, I mean, if you compare the statistics between Quebec and France, for instance, because France is also a country where there are a lot of murders of women. Uh, fem uh, do you say in English feminicides or femicides? I don't I'm know. Not totally I'm sure. Not sure either. <laughs> um, but uh, there, are, it's um, it's similar. Let's say toute proportion gardée, uh, the deaths of women and the deaths of women in, uh, in France and in Quebec are somewhat similar. There is also in France a huge um, uh, problem with violence against women. Were, were there as many before? Did we not talk about it? Maybe. I, I can't answer that because it's, it's not my specialty. I, I, all I know is that I, I now I pay, I, I'm very, of course, very attuned to, to what's going on. Uh, of the 17 women who have been killed uh, since the beginning of this year, nine of them were women of color. That says something as well. Uh, we don't tend to say that in the newspapers. We don't tend to point that out. Uh, when a white woman is, um, is killed, there seems to be a much a more of a brouhaha around it, which uh, is, 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 is uh, symptomatic. I mean, we know this, uh, that when it's a native woman, uh, there, I think now there tends to be um, a better, um, let's say, a greater sensitivity to it, but this is pretty recent in our history. Um, did the pandemic uh, accentuate the violence against women? Most probably. Um, what SOS Violence Conjugale and the organisms who do take care of women, of battered women, to, to put it that way, uh, say that there was, there, is a, a definite, there was a definite problem during the pandemic because of confinement. Confinement prevented women from getting help. Uh, the only help that maybe they could get was through writing on Facebook to SOS Violence Conjugale and doing it when they weren't being watched by their controlling partner. 
Uh, in other, in, in other, when we weren't in confinement, usually their partners would be out of the house or even they would go out to work and then there would be a possibility of getting help. But confinement just made them confined with their jailer. That's how they put it, which augmented the number, uh, I mean, the amount of violence against women, which we don't, we can't even evaluate that, right? Because that's often secret, um, hidden. But um, the femicides are, are definitely linked to that situation. Now, of course, there are hundreds of questions that are linked to the question of violence against women um, that have to do with toxic ma masculinity, for instance. Um, we're talking about that more and more. Uh, we're, um, we're listening to people who have been studying masculinity, uh, which when I work about the, talk about the boys club, I'm talking about a structure, a figure, a way of organizing. It's like a choreography of society, but it is um, the theater of toxic masculinity. We could, it, that could be the connection that we make. And by toxic masculinity, we mean, well, how we still value, and you can see it just in, in movies, in the most, you know, the, uh, in movies that we watch on Netflix or, or, or in the movie theaters, whatever, um, we still value violent, aggressive men, um, men who raise their voices, men who impose themselves, men who manspread, who, who take, um, who speak over everybody. Uh, that also, that tends to be seen as authority rather than bullying. Um, so we, and, and I, I mean, we could talk about that for a long time, but this question of toxic masculinity has to be undone. It has to be talked about. Uh, they're connected. There would be no violence against women if there weren't any toxic masculinity. I, I think they go, they go hand in hand. Um, so what the pandemic has done that is good is that these topics are coming to light in a way that's maybe more direct than they were uh, before the pandemic. And I guess you know, my follow-up would be, it might then add credibility to some of the arguments and weight to some of the arguments that you're making. So the problem uh, for me is, so if we're forced in a confined environment, then certain societal you know, challenges come yeah. out. Whereas, you know, if we're going to work in our separate ways, maybe we just don't have time for those things to surface. Even if, you know, we're going our separate ways, uh, you know, things aren't ideal for women in, in oh, that definitely. world either. But yeah. that, you know, uh, they seem to be enhanced uh, in confinement yeah. and they were just revealed. And I guess that's related to the increase in uh, the feminicides yeah. that we're yeah. seeing. Okay. But I mean, to analyze what confinement does, we have to analyze, we have to, to take all the factors in consideration, right? It's what part of, um, what social class, what kind of living arrangements. I mean, if you're in a, in, in a two bedroom apartment and you have two parents and four children, of course tension is gonna, is gonna rise. Um, we can't just, um, en français on dirait trier sur le volet, on peut pas juste se mettre à s'intéresser aux rapports hommes-femmes comme si c'était euh, dans une espèce de vide. Les rapports hommes-femmes ont tout à voir avec le, le, euh, la question économique, avec la question euh, de la communauté culturelle, mais au sens où quelle est la pression mise sur ces communautés-là. Euh, si le, la pandémie, elle a frappé de manière hallucinante le quartier Saint-Michel, ou Montréal-Nord. Donc, on ne peut pas juste euh, s'en laver les mains. On ne peut pas juste dire, bon, ben, c'est ça, ça se passe là, mais c'est pas... Ben oui, mais il y a des raisons pour lesquelles ça se passe là. Donc, à chaque... Je pense que pour chaque cas de féminicide, il faut aussi analyser euh, le contexte dans lequel ça s'est passé. Et ce travail-là n'est pas encore en train de se faire de manière publique. Peut-être que ça se fait, ça se fait sûrement euh, ailleurs, là, mais it hasn't yet trickled down to us. But we can't... We have to be very serious about analyzing things. And I think I would say that in general. It's like it's easy to generalize, and I think as feminists we do need to generalize to some level, to some degree. But you always have to remember that we're also analyzing case by case and taking into account every factor. That is what we um, what we talk about when we talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality is how everything gets crossed. It, it is how oppressions play uh, together. It's not just about oppression between men and women. I mean, that in itself has to be deconstructed, but it, it is how everybody, every factor has an impact. So you have to consider every part of that to come back to identity. You have to take, take into account every aspect of the identity. I mean, from everything you can imagine of a, a cer in a certain étude de cas, let's say. Vous voudrais revenir peut-être sur la masculinité toxique euh, dans le sens que tu as écrit euh, deux livres un peu intergénérationnels 
« Il y a le monde est à toi » et le dernier euh, livre qui vient de sortir. Euh, « Pompierre et pyromane ». Oui. Euh, <rire> dans, les, dans les deux, tu, euh, tu écris à ta fille. Mm -hmm. euh, si jamais tu avais un garçon, un mm -hmm. fils, mm -hmm. quel serait ton discours? Qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait faire, qu'est-ce qu'on devrait faire en tant que parents, éducateurs, société, mm -hmm. afin de éduquer, aider à nos garçons, à nos fils à sortir, de, de ne pas entrer dans cette masculinité toxique. Oui, c'est toujours difficile. On me pose souvent la question. C'est vrai que c'est difficile pour moi d'y répondre, parce que j'ai envie de dire si, si j'avais eu un garçon, je pense que j'aurais tenu le même discours que celui que je tiens à ma fille. J'ai comme... C'est très... Um, there are two things, like two contradictory things for me. Uh, but that I, I believe and defend at the same time. And I say this to my students. As a feminist, I need to defend the right of life or the life, the livable life that women, I mean, whether they are biological, I mean, psi or trans, but I have to defend women because they are the ones, we are the ones who are most often attacked. It's our lives that are put like en peril, that are menaced. But at the same time, I don't want to believe in that binary. I don't want to believe in man against woman. I don't believe in that essence. I, want to, I really want to think or to, I would like us to have a world that would be beyond that binarism. Um, that's why trans rights today are so important. I think we, we, and we have to be very careful what they're doing right now. Our government is slipping, trying to slip something in the uh, reworking of le droit de la famille. Did you see this? They want to oblige, make it compulsory for a trans person uh, to have a surgery in order to change their name. I mean, that's, that, is, that is awful. That is, uh, it's going back, um, I don't know how many years. That is going against because the fear of, how am I going to say this? There's a fear right now, let's just put it generally like that. There's a fear that we won't know who is who. So there is a portion of the population and of the government um, or a certain government uh, that is adamant in defending what is a man and what is a woman. So to go back, I don't believe in that. I think we're more than that. I think we're more than just men or women. So I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. There, is a, there needs to be a fight right now because Those considered women are being killed. Let's put it that way. But the world I want my daughter to imagine, and it is the world that she imagines, or that she would like to imagine, is a world where being a woman would not count that much and being a man wouldn't count that because we would know that gender is much more fluid, much more complex, much more interesting than just being a man and a woman. And that carrying or not carrying a child doesn't really matter that much. That is just what a body can do, right? So when I'm asked, what would you say to a son? I think that's what I would say, it, which is the same thing that I say to my daughter, who I haven't brought up as a woman. I brought her up, or as much as I could, as a human being. But her being a woman is not like a factor that was part of our conversation. As she, she's now your age, so today she has her own take of, on what it means to be Eleonore, 18 years old, Cégep, I mean, she is defining her own identity, but, and we do discuss gender rights and all that, but it's, um, I think my, my dream was to have a child that was just a very strong human being who was able to analyze the world and be critical uh, when looking at the world, whether a woman or a man. So I can't say because I, I, I have had that child, <laughs> but that's my hope, that that's what I would have said. If I had a young man, I, I mean, my daughter has boyfriends, she has friends, um, male friends or uh, um, friends who identify as male, and we do talk about gender issues. And I see uh, a much greater variety or fluidity in their own gender identity than I did with um, males my age when I was growing up. So I, I have hope, uh, and, and they're open to, to talking about things. And when they do have, because they do have this... Um, sometimes this uh, default uh, behavior where, for instance, my, my, my daughter's partner right now would tend to speak very loudly, speak over her, and I have to say, hey, 
let her speak. Like, let, just let her speak. You don't have, and she calls him out. And so there's an education that takes place in a very loving way. But um, I think there needs to be a constant sort of reminder. Um, calling out is a bit too strong, maybe, but just a constant sort of calibration and saying, you have, we all learn, um, we have acquired behaviors, uh, things that we catch not only from our parents, but from our peers and our professors and our teachers and uh, popular culture, and that needs to be constantly talked out. Let's say it needs to be discussed. Like, I mean, the, the one thing that I'm thinking about is the conundrum, right? Is in order to get there, not to see that anymore, yeah. we have to go through the separation exactly. and identifying what the problems and what the differences are mm -hmm. today and what causes and what, what br brings us there, right? Yeah, that's so, exactly it. Yeah. Right, okay. You have to super see it to not see it one yeah. day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so I think unless, Katri, you have anything else to add, I'm going to... Uh, open the floor to questions from our students I if you want to. We can go with the students and yeah. then if ever we have some time, some time at, the, at the end, I might add a few questions. All right, folks, so it's your turn, right? So I want to see, I want to see some hands, you know, whatever questions you might have, you know, for Professor Delvaux. Uh, she's here, uh, you know, to answer them for us on the basis of things that we just talked about, uh, other questions that you might have. So Who's going first? We need we need one person to break the ice, and then I'm sure we're going to get going. Did we bore you to death? Oh my God! It sure looks that way. No? Nope? Okay, here <laughs> we go. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you if you think that um, there is anything specific about the sexism that women in Quebec experience, like if it's worse or if it's better than the rest of Canada, because mm. um, like I hear it a lot that women in Quebec have it better. Yeah. Than the rest of Canada, like, do you think that's true, or do you think it's the opposite? I tend to be very um, worried when I hear that, and I do hear that. Um, I've I've heard myself say to a couple of young uh, women from France who had just immigrated here, uh, who were telling me, "Oh my God, it's so much better here," and I said, mm, "Be careful, because it's a bit of a false impression." I think Quebec has been saying that for a long time. Like, we were hearing that when I was 20, so that's, you know, 30 years ago. Um, we've always heard that, oh, Quebec women are so strong and we're so um, advanced in terms of women's rights. And yes, feminists in Quebec have been working for a long time and have fought and fought and fought and have gained some rights. But on a sort of ordinary basis in everyday life, is it better here than anywhere else? I wouldn't say so. I think that's a dangerous slope, and I think it's um, it's something that governments have um, have banked on for a long time uh, as a way to dismiss feminism and saying, "Oh, but you've got it all." I mean, we read that in the newspaper, like in right-wing newspapers, you know, frequently that women here have it all, but it's not actually not true. If we did have it all, 17 women wouldn't have died. Since January, if we had it all, women wouldn't be running everywhere, doing all the, you know, all, still all the domestic chores while having full-time jobs, while worrying about getting um, sexually abused. I mean, the rates of sexual violence in Quebec are a sign that things are not so good for women here. So I think we have to be very, very careful and not buy into that discourse. Not to say that li life is terrible here, it's not what I'm saying, but we have to be vigilant. I it's not true that we can just, you know, let our guard down and everything's fine. It's not true. My daughter's 18 and sexual violence around her is a common thing. And we as feminists have been fighting for years, I mean, for decades against it. So no, I don't agree with that. I think it's a cliche. It's a cliche that satisfies Quebec, but it's not true. It also has been used politically. Completely. Uh, to, uh, to, for, to, to create certain bills, for example, yeah. that we know. Yeah. Uh, equality being one of the basic values. I mean, seriously, that's the insult, right? To say we're going to create this law because we believe in the equality between men and women. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, there might Give be, us proof. There would be other, yeah. other no domains kidding. where that could be true. Definitely. Maybe no, we should so. start by paying women the same amount of money for the same I jobs mean, that men do. I know. I mean, seriously, the examples are innumerable. You know, the poorest category in our society are single mothers. They're the poorest people in our society. I mean, that says a lot. Right. 
going over across to the other side. Am I going to have to leave the room and come back? It looks that way. Give me a second. <laughs> and I'm back. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you saw during the pandemic, there was an issue all over internet of all men or not all men. Yeah. And earlier you said, sometimes as feminists, we have to generalize. Yep. And I was wondering what was your take on the whole all men or as not men all say, men. Yeah. not all men. Yeah. I think, I think it is a politically an important, I mean, I think politically not in the sense of our government, but like politically for me or in a feminist perspective, uh, it is important to generalize. And it's funny because last, like a few days ago, I put a, a post that became sort of viral and, and in it, I just said whether we're um, um, uh, abandoned lovers or, you know, frustrated feminists, I mean, I'm just summarizing, we don't kill you. And women just relayed, 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 relayed the post. And then, of course, I had a couple of men who came on and said, but no, not all men. It's like, we are not saying that all of you are murderers. It is not what we're saying. But we're saying there is a systemic sexism and there is a systemic misogyny, and misogyny being, etymologically, the hatred of women. And there is a hatred. Otherwise, there would not be so much violence. We talk about 17 women killed, that's not talking about the number of lives, of women's lives that have been destroyed. I mean, it's all fine, you know, the, now we have actual dead women, but think about the woman who's been beaten every day of her, you know, of her adult life because she's been married to an abuser, but those bruises she lives with. Or a, a young woman who was raped when she was 15 or a victim of incest when she was a child. Is her life livable? Is she living a livable life? So when we say all men, it's not a way of saying you and you and you. It's saying think about the system in which we live, where abusing a woman um, is a, an ordinary act. It's an ordinary thing, putting pressure on your girlfriend because you want to have sex and she doesn't. That is violent. It is violent. Expecting that the woman who lives in your house cooks you a meal every day, that is violent towards that woman. That should not be an expectation. So every little gesture that we, um, that we do every day, every act, tous les actes qu'on pose, have to be analyzed in that perspective. So yes, I think that the all men is a strategy. It's a discursive strategy. And if we can't see that strategy, when a man says, no, not all men, then I'm thinking, well, I don't know what you're feeling guilty of, but go look at the mirror. I think it's, well, if I can say it, like, it's all men because we have to worry about all men. Exactly. It's not necessarily, it's not true that it's all men. No. But because of the society we live in. Yep. And because of how many cases there is and because we are women, we have to worry about yep. all men even if it's not necessarily I, all exactly, men. Exactly. Because it's not all men. It's that it's which men. It's like we need to wonder which men. When is it going to happen to me? I mean, that is when I talk to young women and they say the moment that they set foot in their sexual life, to put it like, you know, put it that way, it's, is it going to happen to me? Am I going to be a victim of sexual violence? It's like you're taking a risk the moment you get into a relationship with a man. So if that's still what's going on in people's heads, then yes, it, there is a problem. And that saying all men is a way of pointing that out. It might be maladroit, it's not completely accurate, but so what? I mean, at some point, you have to be radical if you want something to be heard, right? Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? Some, uh, you know, maybe the men can ask a couple of questions, folks. This is not something that we should here. be, you know, not participating in. I think that's one of the problems, actually. Yeah. Vous avez mentionné l'équité, mais genre l'égalité. Moi, d'habitude, j'utilise plus la justice qu'autre chose mmh, parce ouais. que je me dis qu'il manque des choses. Ouais. Il manque, on n'a pas donné euh, les mêmes droits pendant très longtemps aux femmes ouais. qu'aux hommes. Fait que je parle plus de justice dans ce cas-là. Mmh. Et je me disais, toutes ces femmes-là qui ont vécu, par exemple, des choses au sein d'une un, période politique, par exemple, puis qui ont vécu genre, des, par exemple, des agressions sexuelles ou quoi que ce soit, je dis plus que c'est de la justice que de l'égalité. Mmh. Comme on, on, 
on doit parler de ces femmes-là, puis on doit leur donner genre de l'avant. Fait que je sais pas vous comment est-ce que vous différenciez égalité et justice euh, dans ce cas-là, genre dans ce sujet-là. Euh, écoute, je t'avoue que pour moi ça c'est des, pour moi c'est peu importe les mots qu'on utilise, je pense qu'il faut parler de ça. Donc, de manière ordinaire, si tu veux, je comprends ce que tu dis. Je pense que tu as raison, qu'on peut parler d'injustice plutôt que de droit à l'égalité. ou bon, euh, Et qu'on se sert des mots suivant ce qu'on essaie de faire passer comme message. Après, dans, la, dans, la, dans, la, dans le sens profond de ces mots-là, c'est sûr que si on parle de justice, on parle de loi, de, de régime de loi, on parle de, 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 du juridique en termes gouvernemental. Et ça, c'est un autre, un autre système. Mais, mais moi, je ne suis, suis pas très à cheval sur le, lang sur le langage. Je suis littéraire, là, mais bien honnêtement, je pense qu'il faut dire les choses. Puis on les dit comme on peut. Euh, et après, on négocie les mots, on négocie le langage. Il n'y a pas de manière parfaite de dire les choses. C'est comme le, le « all men euh, ». Non, ce n'est pas tout à fait ça. Non, ce n'est pas tout à fait vrai. Puis oui, c'est un peu trop fort, mais « so what ?» À un moment donné, il faut dire les choses. Il faut essayer de dire les choses. C'est déjà difficile de les dire. C'est fait que si on se trompe, si on n'est pas tout à fait, c'est pas tout à fait le bon mot, ou s'il faut comme modéliser nos propos, ben on, on le fait. Tu vois ce que je veux dire ben Justement, c'est justement, c'est pour ça que je pose la question parce que with the not all men, ben on a eu encore une fois des gens qui disent ah oh, mais genre soyez spécifiques. Mm -hmm. Fait qu'on a toujours ce genre de groupe là, c'est toujours le même groupe là qui dit toujours ah oh, ouais, je plus, sais. Et tout. Ouais. Fait que du coup, ben moi en tant que femme, genre quand qu'on me parle ou quand je dois m'expliquer, disons, mm. ben, j'ai toujours la pression de toujours devoir donner des détails exact. de pourquoi, de ce que je pense. Absolument. Alors que autres personnes, oui. euh, ouais, oui. ben, ils n'auront pas besoin de donner ce, ce type de détails-là ou non, le nom de détails que je vais donner, par exemple. Oui. Et ils vont quand même se faire comprendre, et même mieux que moi, oui. par exemple. Oui. C'est pour ça que je me demandais, le, comme vous, parlez, vous dites, tant que le message se rend, c'est ça qu'il faut. Oui. Mais souvent, ce n'est pas comme, non, je comprends. C'est pas ça qui arrive. Non, 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 je comprends. C'est quand même frustrant aussi. Ben mais... non, c'est sûr, mais c'est comme pour le racisme systémique, tu sais. Non, non, mais tu sais, dans le détail, oui, il peut y avoir du racisme, mais non, en, en, en tant que système, tu es comme, mais s'il y en a dans le détail, c'est qu'il y en a dans le système. Enfin, moi, je vois pas trop comment on peut voir les choses autrement, là. Puis, je trouve que c'est intéressant parce que tu dis, bon, on te demande de donner des détails, puis c'est vrai qu'on va demander aux femmes, on va dire, oui, mais toi, toi, tu as vécu ça comment? Toi, donne-moi la preuve que tu es victime de sexisme. Puis, j'aurais envie de renverser la vapeur puis de dire, Donne-moi la preuve que tu n'as pas été, euh, que tu n'as pas, toi, fait du sexisme. Donne-moi la preuve. Dis-moi que toute ta vie, tu n'as jamais, jamais, jamais posé un geste qui pouvait euh, causer du tort à quelqu'un qui s'identifie ou qui est une femme. C'est juste renverser le truc. Puis, en passant, je pense qu'on a le droit de ne pas répondre à ces questions-là. Vraiment. Merci. Merci. You speak a lot about like a, a woman or someone who identifies as a woman, and I just like to understand like what would be like there is a we could say biological difference, but when it comes to like understanding the like difference, would like as a trans man or as a trans woman or as anyone who defines in the binary scope, what would be the difference in like identifying as that like? Why would we have to put like the word specifically? Mm. You mean why I specify it when I talk? Well, yeah, maybe, yeah. Like just general. Well, I think because I don't want to exclude. So my way of being inclusive is to single it out. Um, in my mind, being a woman has to do with how someone can identify you as a woman. I mean, you can be a binary person, but someone who's violent may just you know, single you out because you're on the feminine scope. Let's say, okay. So that in, it includes that, it includes trans women, it includes side women, it includes women who are uh, menopause, it includes women who had hysterectomies, it includes all of these women. But in kind of a general conversation, that is still um, a cause for debate to my great, I mean, it drives me crazy, but it still is. Um, you still, I mean, there, um, there are constantly letters published in newspapers that you know, want to attack the rights of trans people, I, which I just said, I mean, the actual government is attacking the rights of trans people. So that's why I specify it, to make sure that that inclusion is visible. Otherwise, it's, um, it's not visible. And then the other question could be, the question would be asked, could be asked, well, what women are you talking about? Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. 
There's a question in the back. I'm going to do my disappearing act again and come back around. <laughs> it won't be long. Here we go. Uh, hello. Hi. I've seen it become a trend among young men to conflate the word feminism with the idea of misandry or the oh, belief that yeah. women yeah. should be treated better than men, yeah, no. and they s use that as an excuse not to call themselves a feminist. What do you say to people who have that false association? Oh my God, I think it's done in bad faith um, on some level, or if it's young men, as you say, maybe it is out of some, um, it's unconscious. I mean, it's not, it's because there's a lack of awareness or lack of, of knowledge. I think a lot of adults are saying that around uh, young people, um, a lot of, um, of men and women. Uh, who are l'ancienne ministre de la justice ouais. Ouais. ou de la condition féminine de la condition mais... féminine il y a quand même encore aujourd'hui une allergie au mot féministe it, it still remains something that's debatable or that is sort of um, it's like the F word <laughs> right um, and I think young people sort of um, they're like parakeets and they, 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 they transmit that without really thinking about what it means I keep I've been, I've been accused in newspapers of, um, of hating men. And the moment you are a vocal feminist, that is the thing, you, they, we, they, they put that on you. They just put that it's yet on you. Oh, if you're a feminist, then you hate men. It has nothing to do with that. Feminism is not about hate. It's actually ag it's against the hatred of women. That's what feminism is about. It's not about ha hating men. I mean, if there's something that feminism says, it's asking men to love women better. That's what feminism is asking, right? In the end, it's a, it's a question of love, not, not of hate. But there's, um, it's easy. It's an easy sort of cop out to say, oh yeah, but feminism is about misandry and you know, feminists hate men. And the other thing of feminism being for better rights for women, like that women would be on top of men, I mean, on what planet? Seriously. <laughs> we don't even want that form of power. We're not even interested in just switching things around. We don't want to be à la place des hommes. We want that structure of power to disappear in itself. We're against that form of power. Are you following me? Like, it's not just about renverser. It's about changing the system. Perfect. Another question here. Est-ce que vous pensez que le code vestimentaire qu'on nous impose des fois à l'école euh, peut être une des raisons pour lesquelles on commence à objectifier les femmes? Ah oh oui. C'est qu qu -ce quoi votre vision des choses par rapport à ça? Ça me met vraiment beaucoup en tabarnak. <rire> je suis en parfait désaccord avec le code vestimentaire. Vraiment. Mais comme euh, je suis en désaccord avec les féministes qui s'opposent au voile. Laissez-nous tranquilles. Laissez les filles tranquilles. Vraiment. Euh, quand ma fille était au secondaire, elle a, elle a subi, elle aussi, le, le, le foutu euh, code vestimentaire. Et c'était terrible, parce que c'est les adultes hein, qui l'imposent, le code vestimentaire. C'est les adultes autour des jeunes qui euh, vont euh, donc objectifier le corps des femmes. C'est les adultes qui surveillent le corps des femmes. C'est elles et ils, parce qu'il y avait des, des, des professeurs femmes aussi qui le faisaient, euh, qui vont... Regardez, est-ce que la jupe est trop courte? Est-ce que la poitrine est trop moulée? Est-ce qu'il y a un soutien-gorge où il n'y en a pas? Est-ce qu'on euh, voit trop le nombril? Bon, peu importe. Donc, cette objectification, les professeurs ou les, les enseignants sont en train de la mettre en acte. Ça, c'est l'exemple qu'ils donnent aux jeunes. Parce que les jeunes, entre eux, peu importe leur, leur identité sexuée, leur genre, ce n'est pas un problème. Le problème n'est pas entre les jeunes. Il est d'adultes sur les jeunes. Et j'irai plus loin, et je, je l'avais écrit à une époque dans un journal, je pense vraiment qu'il y, y a un truc de... de euh, puis je vais dire des gros mots, là, mais parce qu'il faut le prendre, c'est un peu comme le, le « all men », il faut, faut le prendre comme un, un truc euh, de provocation. Il y a, on vit dans une culture pédophile. On vit dans une culture où on aime regarder les corps des jeunes. Euh, les, les, les mannequins qui vous vendent les produits de beauté, elles n'ont pas 18 ans, 25 ans. Elles en ont 12, 13, 14. On le sait, là. Bon, moi, ce n'est pas un jugement de morale que, que je fais. Je dis juste que c'est la vérité. Les mannequins qui nous vendent les vêtements sur les catwalks, elles n'ont pas 18 ans. En fait, dans certains cas, elles sont obligées parce qu'il y a des gouvernements qui ont mis leurs points sur la table et ont dit, là, on ne prend plus de mannequins qui sont 
euh, qui ne sont pas majeurs, mais dans bien des cas, les mannequins sont jeunes. C'est des petites filles. C'est des, des adolescentes là, naissantes. Là. Et donc, on est dans cette culture pédophile. Et ce qui se passe dans les écoles secondaires, c'est comme si, au lieu de regarder leur propre... Euh, de, de, de tourner le miroir vers eux, là, puis de regarder leur propre désir, leur propre malaise avec le corps des jeunes femmes, on va leur imposer aux jeunes femmes de se cacher. Mais par ailleurs, on va être contre le voile. Je ne sais pas. Um, what are your opinions on indigenous women and all the violence and sexual abuse they face and how big the problem is versus how little coverage it has on media and how little we talk about it? Well, I think you've said it all. Um, I, 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 I mean, thankfully, this is starting to come out. I mean, their attention is starting to be given, but I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed by the time it took. Uh, I'm ashamed that it keeps going, uh, keeps going on. Um, the number of um, homeless women and men uh, Uh, native women and men in Montreal is, is ex I mean, it's cr excruciatingly painful. I'm not a specialist of those questions, but I'm, I, how can I say, I can only insist that that part of our life has to be um, en gros plan. It ha we have to look at it and, and put it like we have to zoom on it. Uh, I think it's going, it, it's happening, but it's slow and it's, it's too slow. If there's something, I, I told you I'm Franco-Ontarian. I, I went and did my PhD in the States, and I got a job in Montreal. And when I came to Montreal um, mid-90s, there was one thing that was um, obvious to me. There was a refusal then to even speak about Native people. That, um, that part of the population was erased. It was pushed aside. It did not exist. And we were in a, what I was hearing was a discourse that I had heard my whole um, youth, because my parents were originally from here, uh, was about, it was a victimiz victimization of Francophone Quebecers, right? That, that occupied, like, the was center stage. Now it's different. I think now it's moving. But we are in 2021. I mean, it took forever for that to happen, and I can only hope that it will keep going on. I don't know if I can be any more specific. Um, <coughs> J'ai vu que le, le, en fait, moi, je prends l'autobus et je vois que euh, à l'autobus maintenant, à partir d'une cer une certaine heure, l'autobus peut te débarquer ouais. à quelque part pour les femmes, en fait. Ouais. Um, puis ça fait juste prouver le fait que les gens se rendent compte qu'il y a des injustices ouais. envers les femmes. Et on fait vraiment attention à nous le soir, puis tout ça. Ce qui vient me poser la question. Est-ce qu'on devrait peut-être avoir des cours du féministe qui devraient être accès à tous dans les écoles? Parce que, mm -hmm. sérieusement, on se rend compte que ouais. dans la salle, oui, il y a des garçons qui sont là, mais il y a beaucoup plus de filles, malheureusement. Puis je trouve que ça devrait vraiment être accessible à tous, ouais. puis que tout le monde doit l'entendre. Oui, tout à fait. Est-ce ouais. est que vous avez des idées de solutions à proposer euh, à propos de ça, par exemple? Ben, je sais pas, tu sais, là, je, je, je regarde un peu, euh, bon, je ne peux pas tout faire dans la vie, fait que des fois, je regarde euh, avec un peu de distance, là, mais euh, la proposition qui vient d'être faite là, dans les derniers jours sur la, la re, réinvention du cours ECR, hein, éthique et culture religieuse, bon, là, tout d'un coup, c'est sur les valeurs québécoises, et puis il va y avoir, euh, j'ai vu, quelques heures accordées à la sexualité. Tu sais, ce que ça prendrait, ce n'est pas quelques heures accordées à la sexualité, puis ça ne prend certainement pas un cours sur les valeurs québécoises, comme on pense, hein, comme on, on l'entend penser quand même, le ministre, là, on, on, on a une bonne idée de ce qu'il met là-dedans. Euh, mais tu sais, un cours sur, euh, qui, qui, aurait à voir avec, euh, qui aurait à voir avec une éducation anti-discriminatoire, et donc où là, il y aurait vraiment... Des, des discussions, puis du contenu qui serait étudié, qui ne concerne pas juste les rapports hommes-femmes, pas juste la violence sexuelle, mais la discrimination de manière générale. Euh, parce que je pense qu'il y a des femmes qui demandent aux autobus de s'arrêter, mais j'imagine qu'il y a beaucoup aussi de personnes non-binaires ou euh, de garçons qui, dont l'identité de genre n'est pas nettement euh, masculine, hétéro, euh, hein, ou qui ne sont pas costauds, donc qui, qui souffrent de la même peur, parce que c'est inquiétant, c'est un monde où... Euh, euh, ce, ce corps-là, ou cette manière de marcher, hein, comme dirait Judith Butler, peut, euh, peut donner lieu à de la violence. C'est cette éducation-là qu'il faudrait faire. 
C'est une éducation sur les rapports de genre, puis une éducation sur la sexualité qui nous sortirait de l'hétérocentrisme. S'ils nous ici, filent encore aux enfants des, des cours d'éducation sexuelle où ils montrent comment mettre un condom, je veux dire, je pense que je vais vomir. Il n'y a pas que ça dans la vie, là. T'sais, à un moment donné, il faut penser la sexualité autrement. Je pense que la sexualité est beaucoup plus intéressante que juste ça. Mais on est hétérocentrisme parce qu'on veut maintenir le binarisme homme-femme, puis c'est ça qui est au centre, puis les maudite valeur québécoise, peut-être que c'est ça qu'elles vont avoir. Hein? C'est que la valeur québécoise, ça va être un homme et une femme et puis une maison hétéro. Mais ça ne règle pas le problème. Là. Mais tu sais, les féministes pensent à des cours comme ça, puis je suis sûre que des groupes militants proposent ça au gouvernement depuis très longtemps, mais ça résiste. Vous n'avez pas idée combien ça résiste. Puis ça résiste même entre les féministes. Moi, les pires attaques que j'ai eues, c'est de la part de féministes blanches qui s'oppose à moi parce que, justement, parce que je veux défendre les droits des trans, parce que je veux défendre un monde qui n'est pas hétérocentriste. Je veux dire, elles sont, euh, elles sont contre. Anyone else? Yes. Um, obviously, feminism has been through a lot for the past history and still today. And we always, I always hear often how women always picture a world where women and male are equal. And I was just wondering, do you ever think that will ever happen? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Not of my, uh, not while I'm alive. I don't, I mean, I don't imagine that. I honestly, there are two things. I don't think things change quickly. <laughs> Clearly, we know that that's not the case. Um, feminists have been fighting for, you know, since the Middle Ages. So seriously, since the witches, witches were feminists on a lot of levels. Um, and anti-capitalist, anti -cap that's hard for me to say in English, uh, and things still haven't changed. So, no, I don't, I don't think I do this in the hope that, you know, in a year, in five years, in ten years, things will change. And honestly, right now, the fights are uh, have to be uh, crossed. I mean, we, if we want there to be um, a future, there is going to have to be a real fight for climate change. I mean, against climate change, so for climate rights or nature rights or, you know, and that activism has to come, I mean, come with feminism. And it does. I mean, uh, eco-feminism is huge. And the ones who are at the forefront of, a, of, a, of the uh, ecological right are women. I mean, Greta Thunberg is the most famous one, but there are tons of them. Uh, young women are fighting against climate change as feminists. So I think that's where we're at. Where we're at. So when you talk about the future, I'm like, well, we'll Will humans on this planet have a future? That is the, the first question we have to ask ourselves. And then that's the fight we have to, to lead as feminists. Any other questions? Yep. Um, okay, so I have a second question that I thought of, and um, it's how do you balance Uh, how do you balance like the desire to create like a safe space in the classroom or just in general and uh, like the need for honest discussion in class because mm -hmm. I've noticed especially when we're talking like um, in a country maybe in the context of like a class focused on gender um, there are students that like have certain opinions but they never express them and they're just like sitting there and they're being taught something but there's no like discussion mm -hmm. so Um, I feel like at the end of the day, like they keep their opinions because they don't get to tell them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the teacher has to, like the teacher has to have certain like guidelines in place and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like as a teacher, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. I don't, I've never taught top down. I've never, I've always, I mean, since the really beginning of my, my teaching um, uh, profession, I, I've always put myself with the students. So I can, I can relay um, knowledge on some level, you know, on concepts and um, writers' thoughts and theories and so on, but it has always been a space of discussion for me. I don't see any other way of teaching. I don't, I don't see how we can um, be, how, I don't see how teaching can be teaching if it prevents students from expressing opinions. That, that's how I teach. Does that answer your question? Or not really? Yeah. Yeah. 
because I'm taking um, a class on like ideas about women, mm -hmm. and I, I've noticed that like sometimes like there's students that I hear speak, mm -hmm. and I know they have like problematic opinions. What are what do you mean by problematic opinions? Like um, so, good example is like what you brought up about trans women. Yeah. Like there are students that don't believe that like that's a thing or that it should be like okay accepted. Right. But the problem is that obviously the teacher wants to like. Um, if there's like someone in the class who's trans, they don't want the, that students to feel like bad about themselves Rejected, or anything. Rejected, yeah. So like, um, I wanted just to know like, how would you balance the need for like? Hmm. Well, but, but see, in a case like that, um, I think the teacher's responsibility is to. We are people of made of knowledge, right? We read, we have books, like we've read tons of stuff, and there is research that exists. There have um, things, there are st statistics, there are things that have been published, there's, there's actual proof. So there's a difference between opinion and knowledge, and that's the teacher's role. So you have to be able to, distinct, to, you have to, be able to help the students to distinguish what, what is opinion and what is knowledge. And that is not um, knowledge that, tra I, I can't recall what you just said, but that trans identity isn't real, let's say, like that's the most sort of gruesome way I can put it. That is not knowledge. That's opinion. And it's opinion that's not founded on knowledge. So as a teacher, I would bring in the proof that that has been an object of study and that there are proofs given concerning these identities. Are you following me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's not a way of saying that the problematic opinions have to be shut down, but it's my duty to show that there is research. And everything that we've heard in the last like year about liberté d'expression and liberté académique and a lot of stuff has been spewed out in the public realm that seems, uh, in my perspective, people forget that professors actually have knowledge and that professors actually do research. We don't do nothing. We're not paid to do nothing. We're actually paid to have groupes de recherche and équipes de recherche and we get money from the government to make, you know, to do, to do these really long-winded uh, research projects and the theories that come out of these research projects are what you're given to read by Judith Butler or Jack Alberstam or whatever and it's not just um, ideas taken from nowhere. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that's what we tend to forget. Universities are places of knowledge. So as a, as a professor, you build your courses built on, I mean, from that knowledge. And that's what you transmit to your students. So it's happened to me when a student has said something and I've said, no, that is just not true. It's not true because it has proven, uh, it's been proven otherwise. It's a, that's an opinion. There is no foundation to that. So I think that's our duty to to dé, départager ce qui est de l'ordre de, de l'opinion comme ça là que que j'ai parce que bon mes parents disent ça puis je pense que peut-être puis le prof qui dit non tu sais il y a eu toutes ces études tous ces articles tous ces livres depuis des années et on, on étudie ça puis on le sait. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. We might have time for one more. No. No? Well, Moi, I'm je gonna, pourrais I'm avoir gonna... une question pour terminer. Oui. Si ah. on peut terminer sur une note. Je ne sais pas si j'ai bien compris, mais il me semble que dans cette idée de fiancerie, euh, il y a comme un paradoxe, il y a en même temps cet effacement de l'identité, cette sérialité, oui, oui, oui. mais il y a quelque chose de... Je, tu, tu utilisais le nom ingouvernable. Oui, Est-ce oui. qu'il y aurait un pouvoir? Oui, tout dedans? à fait. Mais, what I do in Serial Girls is show how this ornamentalization of women that I mentioned earlier is also the way for a feminist outbreak, right? For uh, insurgency, that, that you can use these images of dolls, of Barbies, or so on, like the Fey men. You've seen the Fey men, right? Who take their tops off and write manifestos on their chest. They've been very active in France. There were some in, in Montreal a few years ago. Do you know what I'm referring to? Hello. <laughs> they, they'll manifest, like they'll, they'll demonstrate in front of governments or they, they'll go into a um, United Nations meeting and, and they'll 
take their shirt off and there's something written uh, on their chest. Anyway, that's one example. It's like they took the women from the billboards and they brought them down on the street and they're using that um, objectification of women's bodies in a political way, in a, in a rebellious way. So that's, 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 what if, that's what serial girls are. Serial girls are the, ornament, the ornamentation becoming feminist. How the or ornamentation can be the way to express uh, feminist ideas and rebel against a world that objectifies women. Yeah. Are you guys interested by all these ideas? Yeah, I know it's hard with the masks and everything, and you're far away, of course, because you sit always as far as possible. But are you, does this bore you? Does it, no? Does it sound like, are these ideas important to you today? We're getting nods. That's a we're good thing. We're getting nods. Yeah, okay. So we're getting nods. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I mean, it's like, I, mean, I want to wrap things up. You know, I'm going to abuse my host power, <laughs> which I tend to do, you know. It's like, hey, when you said we're talking about things, which is great, right? Uh, the question about indigenous women and the specifically condition of indigenous women. Uh, well, you know, not to sound cynical, here's your politics teacher coming into the fray, uh, right? But, you know, is it because we're in, a, we're in a state right now where things have been revealed, residential schools and various other things, burial sites and whatnot, and then all, all of a sudden the space has opened up. And because of that, we're you know, discussing things, right? And is it ephemeral? Right. This is this is my all, always my concern. Yeah. You know, when it comes to these type of things, are we talking more about women because of the 17 women uh, and the rise in murders of women? And if you know that goes down, God, you know, willing, hopefully, you know, and it doesn't, you know, keep going, right? Are we still going to be as engaged? So for me, I think the message that I take is that the problem is more structural. And we need to work at it, you know, at a cultural level, at an educational level, you know, and this is why I've invited Professor Delvo here today, you know, because she's exactly, you know, one of those people out there, you know, that does that work, right? So I want to thank her very much for her time and thank her very much for accepting our invitation and being here today. I'll just say one thing before, and thank you, thank you for having me, but just never close your eyes. It's the only thing. Just always be critical of the world you live in. Just do that. Just be critical.